Okay, so you know, I always wanted to start like uh, Robbie Williams in one of the most famous movies that he's played, saying, good morning, Vietnam. So <laughs> I hoped your first caffeine and all the sweets kicked in, so that you will be able to stay awake for at least 15 minutes. So I would like to split this time into two parts, the one that I will be talking and the other that you potentially may have questions. So just to give you a heads up, uh, I have a quite a short experience in security, but not so quite not, not, not so short experience in learning. So ABB decided that they want to have an outsider that will do the awareness part. Because they said, okay, we are so techy uh, that we want someone that is not techy and will tell us how to do learning. Okay, so a piece of cake or a tough nut to crack. How do you think? Let's start with the optimistic version. Piece of cake. Who thinks that teaching VIPs is a piece of cake? Just raise your hands. Just give me your hands. Piece of cake. Okay, two guys. I know you. <laughs> okay, so let's start with this version, piece of cake. Teaching people, it's easy, right? So you prepare your materials, you teach, you communicate, you repeat, and on and on you do the same. You do the e-learning, you do the onboarding, you do different kinds of stuff. You try to build knowledge by sending people to training, you give them I don't know, access to plural side, you think that they are developing their skills. You're trying to build the environment where they can learn. Uh, I know the companies have uh, Fridays for learning, and they're just trying to do all the stuff there, which is cool. But if you think uh, different versions, different approaches, uh, we, of course, do onboarding, we do e-learning, we do on-the-job training, we do Skype sessions, webinars, blah, 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 anything you can, you can even dream of. We will try to deliver the security training with the security awareness training for the end users. But how does it end? It ends with a certificate, of course. How many of you have taken compliance training online on, their, on your learning management system? And now, how many of you really have a great experience or liked this? Thank you. This is the answer that I expected. So if you, if you think of, the, of, of this as a compliance training, if you think of this as something that you have to do, you potentially don't like it very much. But if we think about, uh, about teaching VIPs, the assumptions that we learn all the same way and we have the same experience is not that clear because if I want to teach a CEO, or if I want to teach, uh, okay, maybe the chief information security officer is a person that I can teach something, but going to chief information officer, uh, I don't think I will be brave enough to sit with him and just tell him, you know, I know better what you should do. And if I'll go to CEO, I don't think that it may be so daunting that you will never, you will not be able to speak to this person. You know, it's like you can have a stage fright standing here, but you can have a, let's say, stage fright talking to your CEO. And who thinks that it may be a tough nut to crack? Ooh, at least more people think. <laughs> so I will just tell you what was our approach. Looking from the compliance perspective, we want to have a report that X amount of people are compliant with Y amount of regulations, policies, trainings, blah, blah, blah. But from the VIP's perspective, I don't think that we care any longer about if the CEO has got a certificate of, I don't know, eight of 10 uh, compliance trainings. Nah, because I don't know if he will even do those training. He should, right? I assume that he is doing, but VIPs, first of all, are used to be leaders. So if you are a security awareness specialist, Anya is a security awareness specialist that trained all the VIPs. So if you, have, if you want to have insight, uh, she's here as well. Uh, then VIPs are used 
to other people do things for them. So if you can learn for me, I'm good with it. But that's not the case, because still they have to learn something. And they are as well very busy people. So you just need to fit in the slot, which is not the easiest thing in the world that you can do. And at the same time, you are not very interested in the certificates that uh, they will receive. So what? If you will have 100 VIPs in the company, what does it tell you that they have 100 certificates for all the compliance training? There is not a huge result and not a huge value brought within this. So we want to focus on actions. We want to focus on their behaviors. If you look from the learning theories, uh, the learning theories will, will tell you that uh, the behavioral approach is not the best because you want to have a cognitive approach, you want to have like uh, knowledge sharing, you want to have a cognitive approach that people just build their knowledge on their own, they feel the purpose, etc. But if you look at uh, security requirements, we want all the people to take appropriate action. That's it. We want their behavior to be appropriate. We want their behavior to be exact as we told them. So, let me start with the easiest possible example. If we want to tell people to um, look at the fishing or just be aware that there may be fishing. So what can we do? First of all, we may want to teach them oh, everything about emails. Provide them, swamp them with as, many inform as much information as it probably can happen. So then, when it not works, we may want to deliver more information. Just uh, instead of eight online training, we may want to have 12 and see if it happens. But what we really want to do is them First of all, not to click the phishing link, right? This is what we want. But even in, in the perfect world, we want them to report this email, recognize this phishing. We want them to work as a sensor, like a human sensor for phishing attack, right? So this is ideal world. But how to do this to change the behavior? Of course, the learning theories and the learning models that I would like to share with you, they have this all explained, right? So. For the, from the learning world that I would like to borrow something and bring into security world just to give you some insight or just to give you something to go out of this room. These are like a simple things. There is uh, three elements, trigger, motivation, and ability, right? So if in these, those three things build a behavior. So if we start analyzing this, for example, if we have a trigger, I mean, I've received link that is phishing. It can be simulated phishing, it can be real phishing, I don't care. Let's assume that it's a simulated phishing. Uh, I have a motivation that is built on a few things, time, money, effort, cycles, and my routine of what I do, how I deal with emails. And it can be, it, and it's built with ability. So how much do I know? Am I aware of the phishing at all? And if you assume that everyone is aware of phishing, and everyone is aware of how the phishing email looks and what should I do with them, um, you may be wrong. So if we consider this, what happens? If I just get the trigger and my motivation is low and I totally don't get what the phishing email is, what I will do? It says I will, give, I will be given a raise. So come on, I will click. I want to be given a raise, right? And that's the easiest thing possible that can happen. So the other case on the other side is that I'm aware of what the phishing is. I'm aware of how the phishing link looks. I'm aware of how it can be, let's say, deconstructed. And I'm highly motivated to report it, right? And that's the perfect situation. I mean, we can have hundreds of different cases based on this. It, it doesn't have to be phishing. It, it's whatever the trigger you plan to have as a trigger. And if we'll do this, there is... Uh, I was told that I just need to have one chart and one equation, so here it is, check. So it's a behavior model from the guy called BJ Fogg, and he just created a simple model for exactly two charts that I've told you. So let me just move here so that I will be able to explain. If you receive a phishing email and you think that it's hard to do, right? So you're somewhere here and you're totally not motivated to uh, react properly, you will fail. So everything that is here, it will fail. 
everything that is above this activation threshold, it means that you will su succeed. And you have two things, ability and motivation. So let's try to think what can we do as a security awareness specialist or security awareness team to get this moving. So we have this failure situation and we, will, we have to play with ability and motivation, those two things. So when we start to play with ability, we teach people. We move them from, okay, it's hard to recognize phishing emails to, okay, it's easy to recognize. If you promise me a 50% raise, that's probably not the, not the real email. And then you start to check this, right? So what we can do, on the other hand, we may want to play with people motivation, right? So time, money, effort, cycles, and how can we do this? We may want to play on the time and effort. And it's really critical, because is it easier to ignore this email? Or is it, it how difficult, for example, how difficult it is to report a phishing email? If it's one button, potentially I will click this. If it's two clicks, maybe. But if I just need to open a different system in the different browser window, or I just need to do 12 clicks or call someone, potentially I will not do this, because I'm not motivated enough to do this. So we want to have this as easy as possible and as effortless as possible. If you look at the other motivators, I think routine and side goals is, have I ever experienced receiving a phishing email before? Because uh, maybe I have experience or maybe I've been even hacked through this, but I was never told that this was a phishing email. So that is why you just do the simulations, right? So you just click the simulation, then you say, oh, whoops, you've been phished. But okay, don't worry, that's a simulated email. So we just we can give this experience. From the security awareness perspective, from the learning, we can give people the experience of seeing how it works. And uh, if you have experienced this simulation, how many cycles you've went through. And in one of the examples, we've seen that after three or four repetitions, the result is much better. So the click rate drops and the report rates rises. And, but the cycles need to be performed. So what we want to achieve, we have to work on those two things. And those two things will say that our folks need to be motivated and aware to some extent, to very, very precise extent, that will trigger their behavior, that will trigger their proper behavior. And if we already do this, then we are focusing on the actions and the actions that drive behavior, then we know we want the people to have a routine on when they check emails. What are the good routines? We want to have a good routine with handling with hardware, software. Uh, I don't know. We want people to have a very good routine with uh, using communicators that they will use. And with VIPs, with any other folks, it may work really, really similar. So just to give you a suggested model that you can potentially use for your awareness material, not to look as a standard compliance training, but rather to look like something that you want to do. And the best case is to have like a real live examples. This is a model called CCAF. It's based on the context, challenge, action, and feedback. It was created by Michael Allen, very well known in the learning industry. So if you ever met him, uh, just say hi for me, because I, I, I must say I love this model, because it's so simple and it can drive you th the proper awareness and proper learning. So first of all, you build the context. And with, a, for example, sticking to the phishing simulation, the context is simple. You simulate that this is a phishing, and you create a context automatically. The challenge, the challenge is with uh, recognizing if it is a phishing or, or not. And it's a simple trigger, and you feel the urgency. Right, so you have five minutes to do something. So you can, you can easily build this challenge. Then you have a physical response. And the physical response is, in this case, really simple, click or report. Get hacked or not. And the next thing that is really important is a feedback, and it's a reflection. Even if you've done wrong, then this is a reflection, okay, you've done wrong, now what? So potentially, here's the short video, here's the short instruction, here's what you should have done. And now be aware that we will do this again in a few weeks. We will not tell you when, but this will happen. 
So for the VIP trainings, what we did uh, when we approached those individuals. First of all, before we've approached the VIP, we've approached the VIP assistant. Because the VIP assistant, I think, is a security bodyguard. Because the assistants deal with emails, meetings, setting up most of the things. Then, the next step is to ask how they work, to see how they work, to see what tools they use, not assuming that they use the same tools as we do, not assuming that they have the same work routine as we do, not assuming literally anything. Just see them in, the, in their VIP's wildlife, not interfering with this, but see how they work in order to give them the best support possible. Then identify the exact needs, identify what they need. For example, if they need a secure WhatsApp alternative, just give it to them. Because sometimes they just need your support, not only in awareness, but in providing a proper solution. So the next tip is address them individually. You do not want 100 VIPs in one room listening to your speech. This will not happen because you will never find a slot for them. And you are there for them. So one-on-one -on -one meetings, two-on-one, three-on-one, counting that three is on awareness side and one is on VIP side. Or three-on-two, two-on-two, assuming that there is a VIP with assistant. So this one-on-one -on -one experience, even in real life, allows you to not know something or the one-on-one -on -one experience of learning um, allows you to tell, I don't know. And this is, it's, it's much easier to tell, I don't know if you're in one-on-one -on -one experience than to tell, I don't know in one too many. Okay, use the real cases. Use the real devices. Call, sh show them how rubber ducky works. Show them how it looks. Show them that uh, it's not that far from reality. Show them how different things react. Tell them about cases, not only the business cases that we've lost ac or uh, someone lost X amount of money because of this and that, but tell them about the real life examples, real life from, the, from their life, real life how they can secure their own things, their own data at home, for example. Then provide actions and recommendations. So just trigger them, just tell them, okay, you do it this way, just try to do it this way, and your assistant will support you, or we will support you in the long term. Almost the last, I think it's the seventh, suggest tools and behaviors that are safe. Just tell them how to avoid something and close the loop. So this is our experience from delivering the VIP trainings and continuing the VIP trainings program. And I will just tell you now what can be the benefits of this bottom-up uh, and top down approach. So from the security awareness perspective, we do those two things, right? So we do the classical compliance, we do the Skype sessions, webinars, we do all the stuff for the end users, but at the same time, we approach the top, top people. So first of all, if when we do this, we have uh, VIPs have better understanding of security as a whole, not only security awareness, but security as a whole. So if they have experience of security as a whole, there is a better buy-in. And I think sometimes it's a huge challenge to have a buy-in in the organization for implementing something in the area of security. I don't mean security awareness only, but it builds the awareness of security as a whole. Then, the VIP, what, what we do, we want VIPs to promote security. We've kicked off an ambassador program. So if there are VIPs that are particularly interested in promoting this within their organization, within their groups, we want to use them as ambassadors. Ambassador is a nice thing, but literally it works with cascading security message. So they started to ask questions. How many of my teams are not compliant with XYZ training? Can you send me a report? Can you tell me? So we've been facing the fact that we are pushing, and now after this VIP training, we are facing the situation there is a pool. There is a pool for our content, there is a pool for our experience. And just to give you an example, there is a really high demand for webinars. Recently from one of the teams, we said, okay, 
it was a surprise for me. And because one of the guys told, oh, you know, my boss was on your training, and now, you know what? He wants the same training or very similar training to be delivered to our employees. I said, okay, cool, we will do it. Uh, so how many people is there? I was thinking about 60, maybe 100, but then I realized it's 9,500. So now I see that the challenge is on the other side, how to give the same learning experience to 9,500. It's so difficult to tell. Uh, to that amount of folks. And okay, we will cope with it. But still, I see that for the first time, I see that there is a huge pool. And I think the more we will do it, the more, the, the more need of delivering this training will be. So now it will be time for questions. So if you have any, uh, I think I would like to open discussion now. Uh, if not, then I would like to invite you to our booth downstairs. Uh, nice ABB logo there. I will be there, Anna will be there, so we'll be able to answer lots of your questions. There are a lot of ABB folks here as well. So if you can, ABB folks, if you can raise your hands so that anyone knows where to look for you. Okay, so half of my audience, come on. Okay, any questions? Anyone deals with security awareness? Uh, are you s focusing specifically on Wailin for VIP training? Wailin. So the VIPs are one of our target audiences, right? So uh, we try to, at the moment, we've run one round of VIP trainings, and uh, we wanted to see what will be the well, what will be the impact. Uh, there is, a, I think that on, on the market there is a huge gap on the VIP trainings, especially on the security awareness. It's not so very easy to find a training that will, or the solution that will give this proper experience, like meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Because, you know, we, it's slightly different to teach someone on the VIP level. And, uh, of course, we plan to have it, uh, to have it extended, to close the loop at the moment, to just, uh, remind the VIPs that we are here and we are here to help and to provide other services, not only learning. I hope I answer your question. If not, I just need a further explanation. Yeah. Uh, I was asking about example. When you're showing some examples of uh, phishing, are you focusing on whaling examples or general phishing? Okay, it seems that I'm totally new here. <laughs> no, we are just using the, it's a tool called FishMe that we use for phishing. I think it's not so, I think it's well known. So we're just running a standard phishing examples. But it's, it's we're targeting everyone. So uh, for the VIPs, in the VIP session, we were just, uh, we're just having like one-on-one -on -one session with our presentation with not, not exactly targeting them with a phishing simulation, but showing how it can work and how it really, how it can impact you. Okay. If you would like to test my lack of knowledge of security, then just go ahead. Wow. Thank you. Sometimes there's a exam or a quiz at the end of a training session that you must pass and so forth. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And I presume a VIP wouldn't take an exam. <laughs> Okay, so from the learning perspective, the, um, okay, let, let me just say it this way. Uh, uh, the exam or the quiz or the test at the very end of any training, it's uh, to prove the, it's one of the metrics, right? So it's, it's uh, you can define metrics of, on so many different levels, but the quiz or the question or hereby I give my consent to that, it's the easiest way because then the LMS will report to you that everyone is okay with GDPR and it's cool. But what, from the learning perspective, what I would like to achieve is the change in behavior. And the change in behavior, you need to test simulating something. And we need to check this with external tour. If you ask me personally, I think we can get rid of all the quizzes and all the tests because this is just to prove that someone clicked correctly. It's, it's not a proof that someone knows or, to, or will behave. It's a declaration of the fact that I'm, I'm able to pick A or C. 
Uh, and I don't think that's the best way that we can use technology for learning at the moment. Uh, but you know, p potentially uh, the learning teams will may argue with me. Uh, how do you measure if you succeed or not? Do you have some concrete like number measure to to prove that you are successful? Okay, so. Um, I've defined three levels of measuring uh, on just defining KPIs for my departments. The first one was if we have delivered the learning experience. And it's the very, very basic, right? So are we delivering onboarding or are we not? And it's the first very basic measure, right? So when you just start this new department for security awareness, this is the must have. Then the next is uh, if we've built it, if we've built it, will they come? So then if there is any consumption of the materials that we are delivering, of the communication of the videos, et cetera, et cetera. But, but then the third and the most difficult, I must say, level is, is the behavior changing. So for example, for the, for the phishing, uh, we measure something, we measure clicks or reports. And uh, we've, built some, we've built a metric that is called uh, uh, phishing preparedness indicator, whatever it says. But it's a rate of how many emails were, how many links were clicked versus how many links were report, how many emails were reported. So we want to have this rate. I'm interested in this rate. I want this rate. You know, I want to have more emails reported than uh, than clicked, and that's. I think that's a fair rate at the moment. Okay, I, I saw this one question here. So during your presentation, you focused on phishing. And what other topics do you cover during these awareness trainings for VIPs and for all the other employees? Okay, so for all the other employees, uh, I think the phishing is one of the one of the parts. Uh, and different, first of all, looking at the different departments, because you know we are not only one department looking at uh, security. There, there is a physical security. There is, of course, starting from the onboarding because we want to drive this onboarding. So starting with onboarding is like the password management. Do you have a proper password? Do you know how to handle the devices? Do you know what to do when you will lost your device? For example. Uh, so do you, do you can, can you travel securely? Do you know if you go to China what you have to do before? So this is like not from the, let's say, security perspective, but from the user perspective. So what do you do as an end user? You set up your password. You travel, you have your mobile device, um, you use cloud. So for example, we, on one hand, we have a policy on data handling, how you should handle with data, but on the, on the side of communication and learning, we want to tell you where to store the data and how to store the data. So you just get this kind of file, what would you do with this? And with this context challenge action feedback, you just get this file in a learning experience and then you have to decide. So we are not covering potentially all the topics, and if I just need Anya's support here, so what is exactly, 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 if you can help me, what's what are, what's the agenda for the for the security VIP? Hi, um, it's social engineering, uh, phishing, spear phishing, ransomware, uh, how to travel securely, and also how to how to protect yourself with a strong password or password in general. So now it's a good example why you have to, why you want to have your teammate on your presentation. How much percent of time should be theoretically and how much should be practical? Fifty to fifty or more practical? Okay, there is no answer to this question. Uh, sorry. I think what you can do is first of all there is an approach called blended learning. And with, with this approach, you can, what you can do, if you have like, for example, 10 hours of delivering learning experience for the individual, and you can do this. Um, you can spend 10 hours in a classroom, right? Just giving people the presentation, but at the same time, you can just shift it to the videos. I don't know, five or six videos that will take five minutes and you will drip them through the, I don't know, course of two weeks and then give a practical experience. I think we all learn by practice. We all, we, the behaviors are learned by practice. 
So if you are not simulating stuff and if you are not creating a safe environment to make an error, because this is what you, this is what we want to do with with security awareness, just create even if you send this, like sticking to the phishing, you create a safe environment to make a mistake. So I think that practicality is as much practicality you can you can do is the, is better, but this practicality needs to be uh, understood by someone. So the minimal information that, that you can provide uh, is necessary. So I would like to, there is, a, mm, call, there is a model called action mapping. So in this model, you can exactly map how many contents should be uh, practical and how many contents should be informational. And it says that you provide the minimal required information to provide an action. So if I can, I, I will not be able to tell you in percent how it is, but in theory and with the approach, you provide the minimal amount of information that is required to perform a simulation or action. This would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, my question is not strictly technical, so you can just rest assured, yeah. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm a bit concerned about the situation where we uh, are in the beginning and we want your presentation to happen, so basically we need our VIPs, our managers to be on board to accept the program. So how can we do that except for finding this first ambassador or maybe using some legal laws to force the company, to force them to do something. So how could we convince them that they say, yeah, yeah, you just do your program, just keep me outside of it because I don't want this hassle. So how could, could we do that? Sure. Um, so first of all, I will never take a risk of forcing VIP to do something. Mm, I would rather invite them. So I think the first of all is finding, um, finding the first one. And finding the first one is, uh, is good, but also is, uh, is getting in touch with assistants because they manage the VIP's time. And so that is why I just recommended first go to assistants and then just at least find the first one. And potentially it can be the CIO. Why not? It's, in our case, it's the closest to CISO, so it was natural. But then, you know, we have this EC members, we have this executive boards, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, it's good to go there and tell that it's possible. And then create the best possible experience. And not, not to start with a presentation and very school-like approach. Just start, okay, let's talk security. And uh, I think it's like the maybe finding a back door sometimes. It's not going the official way, learning development department and their boss telling to the other bosses, mm, I don't think so. I would rather find a back door, go to assistants, talk to the assistants, find a time, maybe sit in a conference room for half a day and they will feel bad about you, you know, that you are there waiting for them and they will just give you the, some of their time. But uh, let's say I wouldn't recommend the very official learning approach. So <coughs> VIPs are uh, generally a very good targets for uh, <coughs> for villains who want, uh, who wants to attack our company. Uh, how do you prepare them to receive uh, highly sophisticated phishing targeted exactly at them? Uh, what are the red flags you uh, you want them to spot, even if the attacker is uh, is really g uh, good, well prepared? Okay, so at the moment we are at the stage where we are just after the first round of the training. So they are aware that they can be targeted. So if you have like 45 minutes and you are just running the first round, you potentially are not able to do this. You will be able to spend, uh, that's why I said the assistance, maybe the security bodyguards. Because I think that what we said, okay, if you are not sure, go to your assistant. And your assistant potentially will go to us. Because we are there, we will be their touch point. But after the first round of training, I wouldn't expect that we'll be able to provide that uh, that, that that amount of knowledge. 
So we just we, we can say you know that the first step there was if you are not sure, just don't click, and go to your assistant. Maybe he will not click as well. Uh, what do you think about? Uh, element of competition in your awareness program, like scoreboards, like some percentage, because VIP like percentage and excels. Yeah, I think that they are p they like percentage, but I don't think they like their percent personal percentage to be exposed. I would start there. But if we just think of gam gamification mechanisms overall. Okay, it's recording, so I can say what I exactly think, but I don't think I think it's not the best solution because it can trivialize the topic. So uh, I mean, why it can trivialize? Because you know, when you when you just want to buy like a scoreboard, or when you just want to buy some cars racing to get, um, if you just finish this this training, your car will be the first. I don't think that it gives a best flavor of gamification. I think that the, the good example that I know. For, for example, for data handling, it's uh, I, I, won't, I don't remember what was the company, but it's it's a gamification where you are within the story and you are a spy, and you see the different VIPs traveling, and you are a spy, and you are to spot what they do, and you are within the game, but there are no points, there are no lives, but there is amount of information that you can receive. And uh, and how far can you go with this game? So the gamification elements are not only points and not only scoreboards. I think the more important thing is uh, if it's playable, if it's if it's an enjoying. If you are motivated to start this game, or if you are motivated to uh, to play within this. So what I can recommend you is it's different topic. It's on the, on the personal safety. Uh, there is a website called lifesaver.org.uk, uh, and you can see how how this kind of game on safety, on personal safety, can be uh, can be done and how it can be played well without points. So I wouldn't implement if you just ask me personally as a manager of security awareness. I would never implement scoreboards for uh, for learning because I can I, I feel that they can do more harm than good. Because you know the people that are motivated by competing with uh, with each other will be competing, right? But they will be competing for points, not for change in their behavior, not for change in their environment. They will compete for the points. And what's the risk? If you join this kind of scoreboard as a new hire, you're at, you're the last one. So it can easily demotivate you to just take part of it. Uh oh. I get two questions. How long is the typical training you provide? And the second one is, what, what's the, common, the most common questions they have at the end of the training? OK, so uh, here I will just need to um, get um, help from mine as well. But the typical, typical sessions are around 45 minutes, one hour. They will never last longer. You know, it's, it's really extremely difficult to keep up your attention just, just for, for all of us, to keep attention longer than one hour, right? But the most common questions, I must say, I don't know. So I will ask Anya. Uh, that is a very good question. I'm trying to right now recall uh, what's the most common question, but uh, they're all individual because we are targeting the VIP and we just tailored the training to them. So it's very difficult to answer your question in that. They, they usually ask about how, they, how can they protect them personally and also their families. I think that would be one of the questions. Yeah, the, the one question that I remember that, that just stick to me, no, it wasn't the, very, the most common, but it stick to me and just our CISO just told us about this. So it was, if we have our devices at home, are they secure? It was a question to CISO, right? Do you secure my devices at home? If I'm printing something at home, um, is it better or should I print it at work? Or should I send it to someone to print, right? So I think that, and this was f for me personally, this was a good insight on how to motivate them to learn more on security. So 
you know, because what's, what I assume there's a way of thinking that if I, have, if I have security departments at work, they've done the work, they, they've done the security, security, secure thinking for me. So, you know, if I'm at work behind the wall, that's cool, but my home is exposed. And I think it, it, it's a challenge because potentially it is. So maybe the security service for VIP should even go to the places where they are. And I think that's the challenge. I hope you answer your question. Oh, come on. Friends or folk? <laughs> you underline the value of uh, simulation in the holistic uh, awareness program. And the question is, could you provide ex uh, real, real examples of such uh, simulation related to some, something else, not, uh, not only phishing, but, but maybe even from outside the InfoSec domain? Thank you for adding that it can be outside of InfoSec. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think that th th there can be like plenty of this kind of examples where you can simulate something. And just to just to give you uh, uh, just to give you one example is this uh, lifesaver that I've mentioned. Um, it's a one example, but there was other. Uh, there was a U.S. company called World War Fighter. Before the U.S. were going for the trip to Afghanistan, uh, they wanted to get their soldiers prepared for cultural differences. So how it worked? Uh, they have like a comic, something like an online comic book where you have a huge branch, branch scenarios uh, and you were discussing. It's, if, you were just, uh, if you were just Google connect with Haji Kamal, you will find uh, the, the online example on how you can do this. It's like an online comic book where you just make your decisions and those decisions drive uh, the feedback that you get. And just to give you an example, it's like you enter this, this Haji's house and he's offering you uh, tea. And then you have to pick, just a simple pick and choose, right? Do you agree to have this? or you are afraid. And just to give you, um, what, what's the next steps are if you just say, okay, I'm, you, you can lie, like I'm allergic. You can say, no, I don't want, or you can say, oh, you're very welcome, I would like to. So if you will lie, then there is, a, there is an additional screen appearing with his facial expression, saying that, okay, he recognized that you've lied and then he's not offering you anymore, and you failed. You, whatever you will click next, you failed, right? But then, if you will just uh, say, uh, I don't want to, he's offering you a piece of lamb. And if you will just click, oh, I'm allergic to lamb, then it's again, again you failed. If you don't want it, he's offended, and he's, he's asking you to leave. But if you will say you would like this, you are just getting more and more into it, and there, it's based on the facial expressions of this guy you see that he frowns or you see that he smiles. And it was, it was uh, uh, one of the best rated training due to its simplicity, and on, but on the other hand, on recognizing facial expressions. So I think this may be a good example that is available on the web. I think we are just running out of time. No, we have still a few minutes. Uh, do you collect post-training feedback? What's the general r reception? Do people feel that such trainings are needed not because of some legal requirements, but simply because VIPs benefit from what they've learned? Yeah, so w I will just tell you what was my thing is that we can have like a like a Likert scale or the smiley faces for, for them that they will rate it. But then we decided that okay, VIPs uh, are not the right people to have those smiley faces answer and we rather collect verbal feedback. They tell us, okay, we want more. For me, that's the best feedback that you can have. That they want more and they want, they see the value in this training uh, in a way that uh, they want this to be distributed to their teams. For me, that's the best feedback that I can get. That, you know, from trying to find a backdoor approach and finding assistance that will allow us to teach the VIP to the situation when they said, okay, you know, I like it, I like it very much, and I want this to be distributed within the team. So I, I do collect feedback uh, from a few cases. The, the one case is that I want my boss to be happy with what I'm doing. 
so I do collect feedback. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that I want uh, I want to change this I want to change this training, and I'm just being told that we are running out of time. So you know we can uh, we can just take we, we can just take this conversation outside. And uh, so would like to thank you very much, and I hope I'm not bored you to death. <laughs>